Hey, bro. Hey, good morning. I just need to rest. I know. <laughs> you don't need what that is. If you've taken time to look at your bulletin, you'll notice most of the songs this morning are, again, are contemporary. I request. Turn to hymn number 296. He is exalted. <clears throat>
Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you have brought us together and have given us an opportunity to come to this house as a collective body to worship you, to praise you, and to thank you for that love. Lord, you offer us the opportunity to praise you through songs, through prayers, through your word. Lord, let this day be a day of praise unto you, unto a holy God. And so, Father, this morning as we come before you, you offer us also an opportunity to bring our needs and our prayers for supplication. And so, Lord, this morning as we stand before you, we ask you to be with those that's on our prayer list. Those that have written names that there are so many that we could not recall without a piece of paper in front of us. But Lord, you have recorded them in your mind and you know them one by one. You could recite them to us and you could tell us the need. And you could also tell us the outcome. And Lord, that's what we don't have. So the only thing we have is by faith. We pray, place our trust and care into you. Knowing that you will walk through these valleys with us. Knowing that when we have mountaintops experience, you're there rejoicing with us. But then there are times that we are experiencing the unknown. But there you stand, inviting us into your presence. Lord, we have some in our, in our congregation that are sick. Lord, we ask you to be with those in a special way. Ask you to be with Ms. Weatherford as she goes through these treatments. Lord, with the lady that Cindy works with, Mr. Daniels, her family. And Lord, it's difficult for me even to recall two or three names of Father, you know every one of them. And you know the hearts of people, of people who have lost loved one and are experiencing grief. A grief that is unexplainable, a grief that we can't understand. But Father, you know the hour for each one of us. Some of them come young, some come older. Lord, that those they are lost to us. We go through this time of suffering. I pray for those persons who remain behind. Lord, that we go through their days of loneliness. But Father, I pray, God, that you show your face to them. You show them the love that you have for them and for the one that they have passed on. <coughs> oh, God, be in a special way to them. Lord, I pray for the people of the Bahamas. I don't know if I've ever seen a picture so more devastating than to see a people of with every possession they own. With their house laying flat of the lumber. The trees blown down. <coughs> Lord, man cannot fix that. They can rebuild the buildings. They can restore the infrastructure. But Lord, there's lives lost. People who may never be accounted for. But there are those who remain behind. <coughs> trying to pick up the pieces. Father, I pray that you show up in a mighty way. I ask you to be with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Ministry. As they already have chaplains on the ground. Uh, trying to help these people pick up the pieces. 
not the lumber, not the roots, but the spiritual foundation of their life. Oh God, I pray that you be with them. Lord, be with our country. A country that was founded and grounded by you. The very foundation of this country was built on the word of God. Lord, we've moved that aside. And as Nehemiah did, let us all repent. We may not have had any action into taking the word, but maybe we neglected to stand solid. Father, I repent of my part. And I ask that each of us look into our life and be a spokesperson for God. You tell us in the same word that if we will repent, turn for our wicked ways, seek your face, you'll heal our land. Most people have written this great country of America off. But I don't believe you have. So Father, forgive us and help us to pick up those pieces. Lord, today we've come to worship. We've come to be in your presence to seek an experience with the Holy God. Lord, you've heard our prayers. Now, Lord, hear our praises as we come to worship you in your throne. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. says, welcome everybody. <laughs> oh man, I guess I've got a couple things I should be thinking of. My, anyway, we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. And, uh, look around and see who's not here. And call them this week. You can give them a call. And uh, let them know that they were missed. Find out if there's something that we can do for them. And let them know at their church this year waiting on there. We have any birthdays this week? We sure do. We're going to start with Mr. Milton Hershey. <coughs> ah, is first up. You know, I, I did a little research, Milton. You know, there's very, very few people in the United States that, you know, and I just pulled it up to Google everything. But there's very few people named Milton. So you're in there with a category of very famous people. However, you're also in the category with Pastor Jesse. Don't want to know where Pastor Jesse is. <laughs> now we get to switch over to his. <laughs> He's <laughs> he just, I think he just focused in on that con pie up there. <laughs> you know, I don't think I've ever had con pie with ice cream on it. That's all right. I got a piece of pie in the refrigerator. I'll tell you, you got to heat it though. Don't put it on the cold. Anyway, we're up here talking recipes. Let's stand and sing to both of these gentlemen. Of he lives, and because he lives, 
by Sela. For those of you who don't know, Sela is a great Christian group. Uh, has a lot of great numbers out. Uh, if you'll follow me over to the left on the media screen, you'll be humming this for the rest of the week. Here we go. Yes, come on. Very good. Okay, here we go. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever man may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He is always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus is today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives.
strength away by the power of your
congregation, if you will, stand. Turn to hymn number 330 as we sing Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Thank you. 
is forever. Forever worship you. I can only imagine. presence of this holy God that we have sang about, we have read the Bible about, we have studied about, and for years of our life served this, as I said in opening time this morning, this physically invisible God that who loved us and we have loved. And now for the rest of our life, we will stand in His presence. We will see Him face to face. That's an awesome thought. We have been talking from the book of Philippians. And today we'll be in the third chapter of Philippians. Of four chapters. As I told the Sunday school class this morning, it's been kind of ironic that I took over the Sunday school class and that book is studying the book of Philippians and I had already started a series of sermons on the book of Philippians. As we've talked about the book of Philippians, it's kind of a two-sided coin. And I heard this word somewhere one time, and I'm not sure I know what it means, but they call him an oxymoron. Anybody heard that word? Yeah, a college student would. <laughs> Us who went to Wolf Creek School, still <laughs> haven't figured it out. But it's sort of a two-sided word. It says one thing, it seems to mean another. And what I say about that, the book of Philippians is about joy. He says in the Bible, rejoice, and I say rejoice. He talks about your joy. But the author of the book, who is Paul, is imprisoned in Rome, 700 miles away, sometimes under house arrest and sometimes chained to guards, forbidden to preach the gospel, and all these things, and yet this author is saying, rejoice, be happy. The church of Philippi, from whom he has received an offering through a man by the name of Ephroditus, has traveled this journey and brought Paul a love offering. And the church at Philippi was also experiencing difficulties. But the theme of the book is rejoice even in stressful and hard times. These are sermons that I'm not real, I'm not real good at anything, but uh, things, I, it's kind of hard to preach because every person that you know seems to have some issues in their life. And so you're trying to encourage those persons and to tell those persons, enjoy life, have a good time. And so this week we start our third week in the book of Philippians. And today we're going to walk through this third chapter for the most part. But let me give you some introductory <coughs> comments about this rejoicing in difficult times. Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, verse 20, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. And then the apostle Peter, remember Peter, said in another of his letters in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, don't be surprised as if some strange thing were happening to you when you encounter hardships. Paul wrote in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. 
through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. And then Paul wrote also to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All who, watch this folks, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That, my friends, is from the word of the most persecuted person in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ. I did some research this week because I did not know it. <clears throat> Excuse me. As to most of the people of the Bible, it clearly describes how they died. Eleven of the twelve apostles uh, died a martyr's death. But best records indicate that Paul himself, the Bible records three missionary journeys, but Josephus, who was a historical writer of the first century, and a very regarded, a highly regarded uh, writer of the first century records actually five missionary journeys that Paul took. And Josephus indicates that Paul was beheaded outside of Rome. And Paul says to Timothy, all who desire to live a godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And even in this book, in the 17th verse of Philippians chapter 3, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. What he's saying there is focus upon people whose lives are godly lives. Use them as your model. Use them as your example. Don't so, get so wrapped up into the situations around you personally. And so when Paul has organized the church, he was the founder of the church of Philippi, he says two important things. First of all, there is a connection between fruitful ministry and difficult days. Betty and I had the privilege of spending time this weekend with Lonnie and Belinda Raleigh up in Lynch. And they are two of the happiest people that I have seen in the ministry in a long time. Yet the situation that they have been dealing with for 20 years. And Ron Thacker knows of the area. Pikeville, you're from Pikeville, around Pikeville. And this is uh, in Pineville, which is on up the mountain, the <coughs> 20 communities. Chuck Tackett, uh, by the way, Pat's doing well. She's just staying off her knee. Her surgery went well. Talked to her last night by email. And so she's doing well. But Chuck is from that same region. Is that correct? And so when you go up Black Mountain, you go up in that region up there, devastation is everywhere. And when Lonnie and Belinda went up there 20 years ago to work and help with those people, they work in a community where 500 children attend schools in the communities of Cumberland, Middle, and Lynch attend the elementary schools. 250 of those children's parents are incarcerated. 1,100 kids attend the high school in Cumberland. And half of those are homeless and street people living in shacks throughout the mountains because the parents are there. <laughs> and this is the devastation of trying to round these people up and to 
to to to to feed them and to medically take care of them and to do all of this. And I've never once seen Lonnie without a smile on his face. And 20 years ago, I met him in a little diner up there and had breakfast with him. And as we were walking out of the little restaurant, there was a black gentleman that came in. He was a World War II veteran. And when Lonnie and I walked out, he grabbed Lonnie and he hugged him. If you've read Lonnie's book about the shingles, that <clears throat> was miraculously delivered up there. I had never heard of Lonnie Riley. I'd never heard of the ministry until I went to an associational meeting. I did not know that there was a truck driver in our church at Mount Zion. And I just took notes of the director of mission said there is a missionary that's starting to work in eastern Kentucky. And he has a load of shingles to be delivered, but they don't have a truck. And so I went back and I read this note to our church and on Tuesday night a lady called me and she said, Brother Josh, she says, my husband is a trucker, but he goes to Los Angeles and out west. And by the way, he doesn't have anything to do with churches. And I thought, well, why are you calling me, lady? <coughs> and so she said, but I'll talk to him on Thursday night and I'll see what he says. And if it's, he wants to help, I'll call you back. And I said, thank you. Thursday night, she called me back and she says, I don't understand that. He's on his way back from Los Angeles going to Atlanta where the shingles were at. He has three days off afterwards and he'll be glad to take those shingles to Lakes, Kentucky. The association had agreed to pay the fuel bill and he said, by the way, he'll just write it off as taxes. He doesn't want any payment. And so from there, I met Lonnie Riley because I called Ronnie Lonnie the next day and told him, God has answered our prayer. And thus began embedding my relationship with Lonnie and Belinda and Maritzel Ministries. <clears throat> he spoke of that event at his celebration the other night. The black gentleman that came in that hugged him that was a World War II veteran told Lonnie for the first time in eight years I've had a roof on my house. He had had a blue tarp on his roof all those years, 80 something years old. And for the first time. <coughs> what do you do in such a catastrophe when things like that goes on? Let me just share some thoughts out of this passage of scripture. And let me <clears throat> read a passage of scripture from chapter 3, verse 1. Would you stand in honor of the word? Chapter 3, verse 1, he said, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To be indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Father, thank you for this passage of encouragement. Thank you for loving us and dying for us. Thank you for ministries such as Marizzo and many others throughout the world. The folks, this is home. And Lord, we thank you for loving us. Help us to understand this as we go through life as it is. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share some passages, and I'll try to be done by two. Uh, by the way, Lonnie and Belinda send their love, thanking our church for all that we have done for them. They have stepped down as directors of original ministry. Lonnie is 70. I don't know how old Belinda is. 
but they remain as the president and CEO of Ritzel Ministries. And it's quite a ministry. When you see the inclusive of, I think they have about 19 different ministries from horse stables for autistic kids to lakes that was given to them, a college that was given to them, that uh, when they gave it to Lonnie, he had no idea what to do with it. Shortly thereafter, a doctor from Houston, Texas called him and said, I understand you have a ministry in the mountains. And he said, I'd like to come take a look at it. He came up and took a look at it. And the, the person, the last remaining <coughs> person of this college, Presbyterian College, had, turned down, had been turned over to him had just given the keys to Lonnie, the college and 25 acres of land. The doctor came up and described what he wanted to do was start a deaf and dumb ministry. Lonnie took him out there and showed him the college and he said, this is perfect. How much does it sell for? And Lonnie said, God gave it to me and I'll give it to you if you can use it for the cause of Christ. He gave him a portion of that college and they founded a deaf and dumb college for children, or not college, a ministry for children. <coughs> and I asked him, he said, why did you choose here? And he said, because this is the second largest population of deaf and dumb children in the United States within 30 miles of here. Tell me that God doesn't know what he's doing. Let me begin. Paul says in verses 1 through 3, he says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to get. It is a safeguard for you. But watch what he says. I have this underlined. Watch out for those dogs and those evil doers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcisions, we who serve God and by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. The words of Paul. you got to see the warning there in verse 2 where he says, watch out for those dogs. You see, the people of those days were familiar with the Old Testament Scriptures where you had to abide by those 713 rules or how many ever rules, a large number of rules that said you have to abide by those rules to even have a relationship with its God. Paul says, be careful about those people because they're teaching false teachings. Those who are evildoers who are more involved in circumcision than they are in knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Folks, I want to tell you, the Old Testament is an important part of the Bible because it is the historical facts of this world but it is not the salvation of mankind of this day. Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary is what it's all about. Amen. And so Paul says, there is a warning here for you. And I tell you today, there is a warning to tell you folks that there are false teachers out there today. They want to preach the gospel and tell the gospel that it's, a, it's an easy life. It's a sweet life. It's a life of... Uh, of fame and fortune and good health. And I want to tell you something. It's not always so when you tell it like that. It is a world of hope. It is a world that we enjoy in a place that we live in. But if I ask you this morning, do you have a problem in your life? Are you a believer? And you say that you're a believer. There's very few days or very few weeks that goes by that, that there isn't someone that contacts me or gets in touch with me and says, would you pray for me, my family this, or my friend this, or this and the other. Let me tell you something, folks, as a pastor of church, I have problems too. So I want to tell you this, that, that if somebody is presenting the gospel in the form and fashion, that there will never ever be a problem, be careful. Mm -hmm. Be careful of the message they begin to, to present to you. Some people want to say, send me $10 and I'll, it's not $10 no more, but it used to be send $10 and I'll send you a prayer handkerchief. Well, blow your nose and enjoy it because that's all it's worth. Now it's probably $1,000. Plant a seed. 
dig up the dirt and put some corn in there and you'll get something out of it. Send a thousand dollars to a lot of these folks and you'll never hear from them again. I know Jerry Falwell went through a lot of bad raps and he probably had his problems and his faults also. But I remember a time when uh, an old man in the church I pastored in Missouri was questioning should we support ministries like the Falwell ministry or should we support our church? His givings was a very fixed income. And Brother Dan wrote him a letter and asked him, should I give to you or should I give to the church? Jerry Falwell wrote him back. Brother Dan showed me the letter and he says, your tithe belongs in your church. If you have a little bit left over and you want to send to our ministry, thank you for it. But your first responsibility is your church. Why? Because this church is here for a purpose in this community that we can try to help somebody that needs help. Ridge Road Ministry is placed in Black Mountain because they need help up there. Paul is saying to them, be careful of the theology because when people start painting a pretty picture for you, you better be careful about the artist. Watch out for the dogs. In verses 4 through 7, uh, he, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof might trust in the flesh, I more. Watch verse 5. Circumcised. Paul is establishing his credibility here. Circumcised the eighth day. He was a perfect Jew. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and touching the law of Pharisee. He was on the Supreme Court <laughs> concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law and blameless. But what things were gained for me, those I counted for lost. Paul was known throughout the region. He was a famous man. He could walk into the court system and say, I'm going over here to arrest such and such person. Give me a piece of paper and I can do it legally. And they would issue Paul what we would call an arrest warrant for the day. And he could go and pick that person up and take him and put him in jail. He could, he could beat him. He could do whatever he wanted to. Paul was a Jew of Jews. Paul says, my studies under Gamaliel, who at that time was regarded as the head of the Supreme Court. He was the best lawyer in the land. He was the best teacher. He would be out of the Yale or some college like that. But what does Paul say in verse 7? What things were gained to me? Those things that I have accomplished as a person, I count for loss for Christ. So if Paul looks at his credibility which he establishes there in that one passage of Scripture, Paul says, it's just a waste of time because my service to God is the most important thing. So if we begin our journey with Jesus, we're called to leave behind all those things that sometimes we make as a priority. We think that there are people who are up and out who also need the gospel. People who have climbed the ladder of success only find that they place the ladder on the wrong wall. How many people do we know that have established them as a credible person? If you read their bio and this, that, and the other, they were top of the class. They were the head of whatever profession they choose. And then they get into a, a structure. And they are torn down because they become illegal. And because they begin to pilfer things. And they begin to, because their mind is not in Christ Jesus. Paul says, what I do for Christ is the most important thing. 
many of us here are people who are retired. We have completed uh, the things that we will do as a professional. But we never, never, ever retire in sharing the gospel with people who need to hear it. Verses 8 and 9. He said, Yet doubtless I count all these things but lost for the ecclesia of knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him for not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is God by faith. So Paul brings us to the point there's a value in knowing Christ. It exceeds your bank account. It exceeds your material possessions. It exceeds anything that you do outside of Christ. As a matter of fact, the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 64, verse 6, he said, My righteousness is no more than filthy writings. Said Isaiah. You see, the gospel cares for us. And it cares for us after we decide to follow Him. But Paul said it even stronger. He said, surpassing the worth of knowing Christ. There is nothing that exceeds knowing Christ. But he also wraps in there some things that's interesting. We all experience hardships. We may have had a difficult childhood. That seems to be the thing today. But now have a stable life. Some people overcome, work with abuse, may come with it. Some people deal with addictions and so forth. Some people have studied hard and learned and earned degrees and all these accomplishments that we accomplish. But Paul said, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten with 39 stripes three different times. I was bitten by a snake and I survived the bite of an ass. Paul says, when it's all said and done, as I sit here in the Roman prison, knowing Christ is the best of it all. You see, a lot of religious people Settle into trusting lives of a comfortable religious setting. And their relationship with Jesus Christ dwindles. Because they don't maintain that constant relationship. That relationship that God gives us in His book. That relationship He gives us through a prayer life and through worship and fellowship with others. God has given us a great life. And sometimes we allow it. Fourthly, in verses 10 and 11, <clears throat> that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being made comfortable unto His death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul is saying there's nothing like the resurrection. One of the speakers said this week the three most powerful words in the Bible and this is just his parenthetical expression is come and see. The Bible in John, I think it's the book of John, the women went to the tomb to anoint the body that was placed there because the Jewish law said it had to come down off the cross before 6 o'clock in the evening. And so it was not by Jewish law properly prepared for burial. And so the next morning, early, Sunday morning, 
as they these ladies got up and went to the tomb. And when they got there, they encountered this person, angelic person in white robes. And he greeted the ladies and he said, why have you come here? Have you come to see the body of Jesus? He said, He's not here. He is arisen. He's alive. He looked at the ladies. The tomb was rolled open. And I could just see him as he gestured with his hands to the ladies and said, Come and see. You see, folks, we serve a living God. It's not a God that died on the cross of Calvary and remain there. Dead gods can't help you, folks. Buddha is no more than a plot of concrete in those communities. But Jesus is alive. You see, knowing the power of Jesus' resurrection, the fact that He accomplished life over death, is the message. The power of His resurrection, the fellowship of sharing suffering with Jesus, the problems that we have that we are able to come to Jesus and say, Lord, I can't have it no more. I place this in your hands. <clears throat> and becoming like Jesus in His death, humbled by the cross, but by coming humbly to the cross, attaining a new quality of life, and now in the resurrection. Come see where Jesus lay. Finally in verse 12 through 14. Not as though I had already attained, either I were already perfect, but I followed that if Watch this. There's a word there that we overlook. And that word is that. I may apprehend that. For which also I apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press forward, I press toward the mark for the price of, a prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The word that. How often have we read that scripture? Paul said, I have a personal mission in life to lay hold on that. That which Jesus Christ has accomplished for me. That which Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and by the fact that I can confess my sins and ask Him to come into my life, He gave that to me. And for that purpose, I give my life to Him. You see, that word, that, and I never seen it until I read some stuff this week, reveals the fact that God lays hold on each of us for a reason. Paul said, I never understood it before. But Paul said, Jesus allowed me to suffer for some things. I don't understand it. There are things in every one of our lives and we don't understand them. We just want to get beyond them. <coughs> but Paul said, Jesus chose me for a reason. Think of this. Jesus chose you and I for a purpose. He had a reason, a purpose when He picked you and I to become a part of His current day word team. To share the gospel with others. To serve others. To help mend the broken hearted. 
See, Jesus knows the whole picture. He knows the whole story. I don't know it all, but I know this. I'm in it for the long haul. I'll make my mistakes. I'll make a bundle of them. But I know one thing. I'm not letting go of the male scarred hand. I have an old friend in Belleville, Illinois, that's blind. And every time I talk to him, he says, are you still holding on to the male scarred hand? I'm trying, folks, and Jesus won't let go because he has a purpose somewhere, and he has a purpose for you. I've never seen Philippians like I've seen them this time recently. It's a beautiful book because it's about life and it's not a real life. I can look around and easily say, I believe everybody here is a Christian, but I dare not. Because only you and God know. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, today is the day your salvation can be. Maybe there's something bearing down on your life that's just more than you can imagine. God says, bring it to me and leave it with me. I don't know about you, but I'm claiming the book of Philippians because it's a promise of God. Father, this morning as we come before you, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to worship you and praise you. Thank you for each person that's here. Some people have come humbly. Really could have felt better staying at home. But their desire to worship you brought them here. Thank you, Lord, for those lives. Some are here this morning with hurt in their life, challenges in their life. And they need a special touch from you. Father, I'm asking you to reach down and touch those persons. Help them through whatever crisis they're going through in their life. Whatever you will to be done, let your Holy Spirit work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're this morning and there's some need in your life. God is able and willing to make that, meet that need. Whatever your challenge is, God is saying, bring it to me. What about Brother Jim? He's saying, God will make a way. It'll be an immediate service. You're here this morning and need to make a decision for Christ. Why don't you do that today? Stand, please.